Welcome to part two of our series on the Serapium of Saqqara. In part one, we examine the claims that a lost ancient high technology would have been needed to produce the giant megalithic boxes found inside these chambers. Our conclusions were that the dynastic Egyptians were fully capable of creating such boxes using tools and methods found in the archaeological record. Although these are marvels of engineering, no lost civilization is required to answer some of the more difficult questions that have been proposed about how they are created. If you haven't seen that video, go check it out, as it provides some context for some of the things we'll be exploring in this video, and attempts to dispel many of the misunderstandings that people have about this site. In this video, we'll explore some of the questions we left unanswered in the first video, like, how much do these megalithic boxes really weigh? How were they transported into these tunnels? What types of stones are these? Where were they quarried from? And how are the tunnels illuminated? Much of what you find on the internet about the Serapium is honestly pretty far out, and there are many extraordinary claims made by alternative researchers about this site. But are they true? It's often claimed that it would have been impossible for the dynastic Egyptians to move these megaliths down here into these tunnels because they're just too heavy and there's not enough space to maneuver them. Some people say it would require 250 men to pull them on a sled, and that there's just not enough room to fit all those people down here. So they jump to unnecessary conclusions that hydraulic machinery or anti-gravity devices would be required to perform the work. It's also very commonly stated that the boxes weigh 100 tons each, but this claim is just not true. When you do the calculations of their dimensions multiplied by the weight of granite per cubic foot, this smallest box here only weighs about 20 tons, and the heaviest box weighs about 45 tons at most. Christopher Dunn himself states in his book that this box left in the hallway weighs only about 38 tons. Even before it was hollowed out, it maybe would have weighed 55 tons, which is not even close to 100, but people keep calling them 100-ton boxes in hopes of perpetuating some grand mystery. The heaviest lids weigh 25 tons at most. If the entire heaviest box and its lid were quarried from the bedrock as one single piece of stone, it might have weighed as much as 100 tons. It seems highly improbable, though, that anyone would attempt to transport an entire single piece of quarried stone at that weight, when it makes much more logical sense to cut off the lid, hollow out the box's interior, and then transport two much lighter stones separately. This would obviously be a way easier and more practical way of accomplishing this arduous task. Many people say it's impossible to move these huge boxes through these narrow tunnels, as the largest boxes would have only had about one foot of clearance between the walls of the tunnel. Would there be enough room for skilled and clever workers with the knowledge of leverage and mechanical advantage to maneuver them around the corners and through these tunnels? Sacred Geometry Decoded has a great video all about this that you should definitely go check out. He analyzes the weights and dimensions of the boxes and gives their clearance inside the tunnels, showing that there is definitely enough room to move them and gives great examples of how this could be done by skilled worker teams using simple machines and practical techniques. There's really no mystery about how large stones have been moved throughout human history, and in his video, he shows some great examples of people in the 1800s moving enormous megaliths on wooden rollers, the simple ancient technologies that were never lost. The foundations of the claim that it would be impossible to move these megaliths around down here without the use of high technology are unfounded, and it seems perfectly reasonable to us that the ancient Egyptians were entirely capable of accomplishing this. Ironically, Auguste Mariette already found physical evidence that solved this puzzle more than 170 years ago. People would know about this information if they actually read his original writings on his archaeological work here. But unfortunately, it seems that most people making extraordinary claims about the Serapium have never even read Mariette's original source documentation on the site. Sadly, there's so much misunderstanding about this place, and we think it's largely because Mariette's book, Les Serapium de Memphis, was never translated into English in any widespread public version, at least not that we've been able to find. We've only found it in French. Another contributing factor is the fact that Mariette's masterwork on the Serapium was lost in the 1800s, when the Louvre Museum lent it to the future head of the Cairo Museum, and the manuscript was never seen again. This was a great loss to archaeology, and actually, the Serapium of Memphis is just Mariette's incomplete field journal that was later compiled into a book by the Egyptologist Gaston Maspero. After researching the site for years and feeling like there was so much more to the puzzle that we weren't hearing about from most online sources, 
We finally decided to translate Mariette's entire book from French into English using Google Translate so that we could finally get to the bottom of it. It took us hours and hours and hours to do it, which was totally worth it because it immediately dispelled many of the illusions we were harboring and gave us a clear understanding of the true history of the Serapium. Learning about Mariette's amazing journey of years of archaeology and all that he discovered there was quite an eye-opening experience for us. We prepared this PDF document of the English version of the book and uploaded it to archive.org so you can all download it and read it too. The book is absolutely fascinating and we highly recommend that you read it as there's just so much information in it that you won't find anywhere else online. It's a bit jumbled from the Google Translate, but it's good enough to get the idea. If you appreciate us doing this kind of thing for our viewers, please consider supporting us on Patreon as it really helps us to continue to make quality content like this for you. The link's down below and popping up in the corner of this video, and we thank you in advance for supporting the work we do. Reading this section of the book really blew our minds as we learned that Mariette found traces of wooden rollers on the floor of the tunnel, and in one of the chambers he found two wooden winches with eight levers made of sycamore wood that were used to pull the boxes over the rollers and through the tunnels. We've spent years researching the Serapium, and why is it that we've never heard anyone mention these wooden winches or rollers before? There's so much speculation about lost ancient high technologies, but Mariette found solid physical evidence of the simple primitive tools that the Egyptians used to transport the boxes. What really shocked us though is that he had actually found one sarcophagus left in mid-transport that revealed how the giant boxes were lowered into their chambers, and he and his men actually completed the process themselves. The box was sitting on an entire chamber full of sand, and by removing the sand beneath the box, he and his men were able to lower it down into the bottom of the chamber where it sits today. Mariette wrote in his journal, I then undertook to continue the interrupted work myself, and after having placed four men in the four side niches, I gave myself the pleasure of bringing down in its place, with perfect regularity, an enormous mass. It must have been a pretty epic experience, although we kind of wish he would have just left it there for future generations to see and learn about ancient Egyptian engineering practices. A huge question we have is, why in the world would the ancient builders leave only this one box on top of the sand and then continue on for hundreds of years lowering other boxes into their chambers? It's indeed one of those strange mysteries we'll probably never have answers to, but it's an important piece of the puzzle that proved that simple primitive methods are sufficient to accomplish amazing feats of engineering. He didn't specify what chamber it was in, but his diagram shows the box fitting quite snugly into a small chamber with notches, which we think is most likely this one here. Considering all the videos and articles about lost civilizations, advanced technologies, and anti-gravity devices, we find it so ironic that Auguste Mariette already solved this conundrum in the 1800s. In Mariette's words, there can therefore be no doubt as to the manner which the Egyptians employed to bring the sarcophagi of the tomb of Apis to the bottom of the underground chambers, and what results from these observations is that the use of sand for the displacement and the transport of masses is as indisputable as the use of the winch applied to the solution of the often very complicated problems that Egyptian mechanics had to solve. While making this video, we came across another great book by Arthur Rohn, who in the 1800s gave a second-hand account of the expedition and seemed to have no doubt, as you can see in this quote from his book, that the giant monoliths were quarried in Aswan, floated down the Nile during the annual flood, moved the short distance on land using winches and rollers, and lowered into their chambers using sand. So there you have it. Extraordinary achievements often have the most basic practical explanations. The ancient Egyptians drew upon millennia of knowledge and experience in cutting and transporting stones and achieved things that many people think today can only be accomplished with advanced machinery. Isn't it strange that the explorers in the 1800s didn't jump to such grand conclusions? They didn't seem too baffled by how the boxes were made or transported and used the evidence they found to arrive at rather simple explanations. It's too common that people don't do enough research to find sensible answers to these kinds of questions. Even Graham Hancock, who we're big fans of, made a recent Facebook post stating simply, go figure how those 70-ton megaliths got in there. This type of thinking contributes to a perpetual search for mysteries rather than seeking factual answers. We love Graham, and he's one of the most well-researched authors out there, yet he also clearly did not read Mariette's book, as he would have found the answer to this very question of how the stones were moved into the tunnels. 
Mariette's work as the seminal account of the site should be the cornerstone of research done on the Serapium, yet it's often overlooked by even the most keen researchers on the subject. Again, if there was a widespread English version of Mariette's book, there would be much less confusion and far-out speculation about this site, so it's our hope that our English translation of his book can be spread far and wide. While we were working on this series, the Scientists Against Miss YouTube channel released an epic video on the Serapium. Kudos to them, as it appears they actually read Mariette's book also. They are the only other people we've seen ever mention that Mariette discovered the wooden winches and rollers and lowered the box. They made these great animations showing the process of moving the stones. They worked out the math, and in order to move a 45-ton sarcophagus on wooden rollers, it would require a horizontal force of around 700 kilograms. Or, to be very conservative, they moved the number all the way up to 2 tons, or 2,000 kilograms. Using a simple compound pulley system, 50 people pulling on the rope with a force of only 30 kilos per person would produce a total force of 2.5 tons, which is more than enough to move the box. With the use of a winch with eight handles and a compound pulley system, only 16 workers producing a force of just 20 kilos each would produce a total force of more than three tons, which is far beyond what is required to move the heaviest boxes in the Serapium. Some of the chambers have notches in the walls, in which beams could be installed to anchor pulleys and used to pull boxes into the chambers like this. Some people say that these megaliths would crush wooden rollers, but that just isn't true. If you rolled a 45-ton sarcophagus over 15 logs, each log would only bear the weight of 3 tons. If the logs were each 2.5 meters long, the weight would be dispersed at about 1.2 tons per meter of each log. It's pretty confusing trying to figure this out online, but based on our calculations of the perpendicular crushing strengths of woods like cedar and sycamore, their capabilities far exceed the necessary requirements to move a 45-ton piece of stone. Not only did the Egyptians use rollers and pulleys, but they also rolled the logs on top of double rails as well, which would have made the process even easier by reducing surface friction. The double rails on the floor of one of the corridors in the Serapium were recorded in 1855 by the Prussian archaeologist Heinrich Brusch, who spent time there working with Mariette. He wrote in his book, Travel Reports from Egypt, that on the floor of this main corridor and the following corridors, the double rails are still clearly preserved, onto which the colossal coffins were rolled over rollers. Today, visitors walk on a raised boardwalk to avoid kicking up dust, so we're not sure whether these double rails still exist on the ground beneath the walkway or not. We wonder if they were made of copper or iron or wood. We wish we knew more about these rails, but Bruce only mentioned them in one sentence of his book. This type of thing should be common knowledge, but almost no one ever mentions it, which is also because there's no available English translation of his book either, at least not that we've been able to find. So we also translated this section of his book where he discusses the double rails from German into English and made a downloadable document for you guys so you can read it for yourself and fact check the things we're talking about. While we were at it, we also translated Mariette's other short book into English and made a document so you can read that one too. It's called The Choice of Monuments and Drawings Discovered or Executed During the Clearing of the Serapium of Memphis and is another great source of fascinating information and awesome drawings that give you deep insight into the origins of this amazing ancient site. All of this information is accessible if you have the time and patience to dig around and look for it, which unfortunately most YouTubers and alternative researchers don't do. As we learned while making this video, the information about the rollers, winches, double rails, and lowering the box into its chamber is all ironically right there on the Serapium's Wikipedia page. If you just scroll through and click on the reference links, you'll find a gold mine of knowledge and information in a huge quantity of books and papers written about this site. We went through and clicked on so many of these links, tracked down a whole bunch of books, translated sections of many of them into English, and read detailed accounts of the historical chronology of the site written in hieroglyphic inscriptions so we could truly learn about the origins of the Serapium. And we compiled a huge list of the most relevant and important information into the document linked in the description below, so you can go read up on all this stuff too. It is so eye-opening to dive deep into the literature and look beyond just the main talking points that are repeated again and again on the internet.
Another controversial idea that many researchers promote is that the sarcophagi could have been quarried from locations far across the eastern desert and that the dynastic Egyptians were not capable of accomplishing such a difficult task. The closest of these speculated quarries is about 50 miles or 80 kilometers from the Nile River as the crow flies, and the farthest is about 90 miles or around 145 kilometers from the river. It would have been enormously challenging, but not impossible, to transport huge stones from such a far distance over rugged desert terrain. Through the entirety of Egyptian history, most of the ornamental stones, in terms of volume, were granite, granodiorite, and silicified sandstone that came from Aswan. The Aswan quarries are more than 400 miles, or about 650 kilometers away from the Serapium, although they're quite close to the harbor on the Nile River, so large stones would only need to be transported a short distance over land before being shipped on boats down the river. Based on this map of the different courses of the Nile throughout history, we estimate that during the Serapium's epoch, the stones would only need to be transported between about two and a half to three and a half miles, or about four to five and a half kilometers over land from the river into the underground catacombs. During our research, we came across this really great paper written by Jim Harrell for the UCLA Encyclopedia of Egyptology, in which he discusses the quarry sites of many ornamental stones used by the ancient Egyptians and gives their geologically correct names. While researching the Serapium, it's difficult to know exactly which type of stones the sarcophagi are made of because there are so many different varieties of stones that people often confuse with one another. Many people have referred to them as diorite, basalt, cyanite with porphyritic diorite, gabbrodiorite, as well as other varieties of igneous rocks, but these are actually petrologically incorrect terms. The Aceta Project's website is basically the only place where we found a detailed archive of photos and a breakdown of what type of stones the boxes are made of but they're apparently using the improper names as well. As you can see in the paper, granodiorite is often incorrectly labeled as basalt, black or gray granite, diorite, dolerite, cyanite, and tonalite. And the classic Aswan red granite is often confused with cyanite. Another stone called metagraywacky is also commonly mistaken as basalt, which is also confused as granite and granodiorite. As you can see, this can get pretty confusing. In this map here, we've circled all the possible quarry sites for these types of stones. It's well known that the dynastic Egyptians did use the quarry sites in the eastern desert for smaller stoneworks and human-sized sarcophagi, proving that they had a lot of experience quarrying and transporting large stones from great distances across the eastern desert. But could they have got the much larger Serapium stones from these quarries? And why would they go through all of that trouble when they could much more easily harvest large pieces of granite and granodiorite from Aswan? Considering this, the eastern desert quarries become less plausible sources for the Serapium boxes. Our curiosity about all of this led us to get in touch with the author of the paper, and Jim was gracious enough to answer a bunch of our questions we had about the Serapium boxes. Here's a few segments of our phone call with him, which was an extremely insightful conversation. You know, I can tell you this, um, you know, it has to be limited to just a very few varieties. Yeah. And, and I'm sure that Two of the most common there, as I recall, are granite and granodiorite from Ash One. Yeah. Mm -hmm. None are basalt. None. Okay. That's actually impossible, physically, geologically impossible. Um, why is that? Uh, because you can't get blocks of basalt uh, of that size. Ah. Okay. Hmm. A possibility is the metagree wacky. Yeah. You know, you can get big blocks. It's more difficult than with the Ashwan rocks, but maybe, you know, well, certainly sarcophagi, <clears throat> uh, you know, human sarcophagi. There are uh, metagree wacky sarcophagi, yeah. you know, for humans, not bulls, uh -huh. you know, plenty known. Um, lots of life size statues. So, uh, of humans, not bulls. Yeah. Uh, so uh, a lot of that stone was brought a great distance. Mm -hmm. So it could have been, yeah. you know, but, you know, the sarcophagi for the bulls are, you know, you know, several times larger than those for the humans. Totally. Yeah, they're huge. Huge, right. Um, so I'm, I'm doubtful that any of them would be metagree wacky uh, because of the size, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, a lot of the archaeologists will call the Ashwan granodiorite simply diorite without the yeah. grano. Um, and that's, you know, you have to understand that, as I point out in the article, you know, non-geologists 
misuse and abuse the petrological terms all the time, and it, it, it's very confusing to the reader. Totally. Uh, so um, you kind of have to, you know, what I, you know, what I do in that article, and what I do even, even more so in my book is I, as I show what the incorrect uh, names are that are that have been applied to these stored uh, stones and what they actually are geologically speaking. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you can discount any diorite from Ashwan. It's granodiorite. Okay. You know, there is a geological rock called diorite, mm -hmm. but it was not used, um, by the ancient Egyptians, except in one variety, the pegmatitic diorite. That's a real thing. But it only comes in very small pieces. Uh, they used it for vessels uh -huh. and figurines. What the archaeologists call diorite is a lot of different things, um, you know, and almost none of them actually diorite, geologically speaking. You know, so the only question is what stones, by their correct names, were actually used for the sarcophagi, apart from granite and granodiorite from Ashwan. And um, and for that, you know, like I said, the, the only possibilities were blocks of that size, you know, limestone, travertine. So you rule out travertine, but there might well be limestone there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very, very doubtful Metagoriwaki could come in sizes that big, but maybe, maybe. Um, I've been all over the quarries. I don't see how, how they could possibly get a block out that large. After that phone call, Jim looked at his notes from his visit to the Serapium in 1997 and updated us on some of those thoughts in our email correspondences. He said while he couldn't be certain that he saw all of the sarcophagi, as one of them is behind a closed gate, all of the ones that he saw were made of granodiorite from Aswan, except for one made of Aswan red granite and one made of limestone, which we think could be this one. Interestingly, August Mariette said that he found two boxes made of compact limestone, but we're not sure which two he was talking about. Jim said that the dark gray to nearly black color of granodiorite symbolized regeneration in the afterlife, as well as the underworld in general, making it a perfectly suitable stone for a sarcophagus. We were glad for the clarification that almost all of these huge stones are simply granodiorite that came from Aswan, and that there really is no mystery that requires a lost civilization to explain where they were quarried from. A few final controversial topics we want to address in this video are whether or not the ancient stonemasons were actually doing the finishing work on these boxes down in the tunnels, and how they possibly could have illuminated these dark spaces well enough to do so, as there are no soot marks on the ceiling which would have been left behind by the torches. Well first of all, other than Christopher Dunn's work, we're not really sure where the theory comes from that the finishing work on the boxes was done down in the tunnels. Yet so many alternative researchers repeat this again and again as though there is tons of evidence to support this. Dunn's idea was that these boxes needed to be shaped and polished to an absolutely precise degree of orthogonality and flatness underground, where the climate was stable, so that the stones wouldn't shrink if they were finished outside in the heat and then brought down into these cooler underground chambers. As interesting as the theory of precision stoneworking is, We've already thoroughly discussed in our first video on the Serapium that these boxes are not as precise as people think they are, and Dunn doesn't really provide enough substantial evidence to back up his theory. There's really no solid basis whatsoever to this statement that the boxes were worked on down here in the tunnels. The only evidence of this theory that we've seen is this one box that was never completed and was abandoned during transport. We'll discuss this more in part three of this series, but basically, this was the last sarcophagus that was made at the Serapium, right as the Romans invaded the country and dynastic Egypt officially met its demise. During this turbulent moment in history, this box was the last hasty attempt to bury an apis bull before Egypt fell and the Serapium was soon abandoned. This is why it was never finished and why it was left here in the hallway. But other than this one single example, there's no other reason to believe that the sarcophagi were being worked on down here in the tunnels. Secondly, the Egyptians would have only needed enough light to transport the sarcophagi, enact the funerary rituals of the apis bulls, and seal up the chambers afterwards. It's pretty hard to find detailed information about ancient Egyptian lighting online, but we've deduced that large collections of papyri were found near the Valley of the Kings, which recorded many details regarding the size of the worker teams that dug underground tombs, the number of hours of their shifts, 
the issue and return of tools, the number of oil lamps they used, the quantity of oil given to each worker, the lengths and quantities of wicks, how long they burned, and much more. While roughly carving out the tunnels and tombs, they would use the cheapest lamp oil made from animal fats, which produced an unpleasant smoke that left behind soot marks. They also used oils from flax, walnuts, almonds, sunflower seeds, and other plants. And then while doing the final finishing touches and painting the tombs, they specifically used clean burning fuels that produced a smokeless flame so as to not damage the sacred inscriptions on the walls. For this, they used sesame oil or a mixture of castor oil and natron. Castor is a type of bean and natron is a complex sodium carbonate that occurs in arid lake beds. It's well known that the Egyptians used natron for glass making, mummification, and other medical practices throughout the entirety of dynastic history. During the Hellenistic era, they also used olive oil as a clean burning lamp fuel. There's no mystery as to how the Egyptians illuminated underground tunnels like the Serapium without leaving soot marks. There are perfectly good explanations and countless examples of beautifully painted tombs with no soot marks on the ceilings all throughout ancient Egypt. So why would the Serapium be any different? It is quite interesting though that the walls of the chambers in the Serapium aren't highly decorated with inscriptions or paintings of the funerary texts like in the tombs of the pharaohs. It seems that they had different funerary practices for the Apis bulls than for the kings. As you can see, there are a lot of misunderstandings about the Serapium, yet after examining all the alternative theories, we've found perfectly good explanations to account for all that took place here, and it has become very clear to us that the dynastic Egyptians created this site. We hope this video series helps to provide a nice foundation for understanding controversial places like this, as well as ancient history in general. There are a lot of misleading theories out there, but you just have to dig deeper to find the real truths behind these sensational alternative theories. Because of the paywalls to access academic papers and the general lack of published data on the site, finding scholarly information about the details of the Serapium is honestly way harder than it should be. And we hope you benefited from the deep dives we've done in this video series. Through this presentation of what we found, it's our hope that we can spark a conversation between academia and alternative research that inspires us all to be in the mystery together and maybe learn something along the way. Make sure you tune into our part 3 video on this series, in which we'll explain the full historical timeline of the Serapium that was written in hieroglyphic inscriptions on more than a thousand stone stelae that documented the entire history of this site, one apis bull at a time. That's definitely a video you're not going to want to miss. This enormous body of historical evidence proves, without any shadow of a doubt, that the dynastic Egyptians were in fact responsible for creating the Serapium over a span of more than 1300 years. Once you read through their hieroglyphic records, it becomes so very clear that this site was definitely not built by any lost civilization, and that it was never created to serve any high technological function. This was a holy necropolis for the Egyptians' most sacred animal, the Apis bull, and these stone sarcophagi were carved with simple, primitive stone cutting techniques and transported here using wooden rollers, wooden winches, and lowered into their chambers with sand. A final point we want to touch upon is that we feel that we should all treat each other with respect and kindness, even if we disagree about certain issues. In this video series, we've supported the work done by YouTube channels like Sacred Geometry Decoded and Scientists Against Myths, who are doing brilliant work to discover the truth about the ancient world. One thing we want to clarify though, is that we are in no way supportive of the rather brash, combative, and often degrading discourses they put out that slander alternative researchers and other YouTube channels. We do not condone treating others with disrespect, as we feel it contributes to more friction and actually impedes progress. It is our hope that even if we disagree with other people, that we can still get along and work towards a common goal. There's really no point in arguing, and when we treat each other with kindness, it's a lot easier to learn together. So please be nice out there and remember that we're all in this together. Thank you all so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed this video and all the hard work we poured into our research in this series. If you liked the video, please give a thumbs up down below, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos with your friends. Also, if you feel called to support us on Patreon, we'd be so grateful for your contribution to help us to create more quality content like this. Make sure you tune in to part 3 of this series, as there's still so much to uncover about the Serapium. For now, take care everybody. Much love to you all, and we'll see you in the next video. Peace.